with the fourth pick in the 2015 NBA Draft. The New York Knicks select Kristaps Porzingis from Leopaya, Latvia. He last played for Sevilla in Spain. can turn these fans around at some point. I almost hate to bring up this little bit of history now, but I'm compelled to do so. Dirk Nowitzki, Pau Gasol were the first European players ever drafted in the lottery. They became all-stars. Since then, 16 Europeans have been drafted in the lottery, just in the lottery now. None of them have become all-stars. Chris Porzingis said to be different. You know what you're listening to? Is that a trick question? It's the I Still Love This Game podcast with your host, Matthew Damien. He's an idiot. Don't listen to this. He's an idiot. What's going on, guys? And welcome to episode 103 of the I Still Love This Game podcast. And my, oh my, oh my. <laughs> how quickly they forget and how quickly they go back. You know, NBA fans, we're a special bunch, aren't we? And obviously, this show is going to be centered heavily around Christoph's Pozingas and not just the fact that he was traded. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to talk about his tenure with the Knicks and how it shows the the goldfish memory that NBA fans have. Not Not every NBA fan. You get some great historians out there. But it was only in 2014 when he was drafted. And how quickly we forget. And this is why it was so compelling for me to, to make this episode. I wouldn't call it an emergency podcast or anything like that. It was just something that, look, was, I was waiting to do an episode really to talk about Phil Jackson's tenure. And these two are very connected when it comes to uh, the Knicks, their Knicks tenure. Well, of course, I'm talking about Phil Jackson as an executive, not as a player. People forget about that as well, that he was actually uh, a player on two championships for them in the 70s. But let's let's keep in mind that Phil Jackson, we have to go back to the Lakers. We have to go to Dwight Howard and the Lakers. And remember that Phil Jackson was fired after they were swept uh, against the Mavericks. People forget about that, by the way. That Mavericks team, they weren't messing around. They struggled a little bit against Portland, but Portland had a hell of a team. LaMarcus Aldridge, Brandon Roy was still a good player. Uh, I believe Wesley Matthews was on that team. Batum was on that team. They, they, had, they were not a bad team at all. In fact, in the first round, uh, you could make an argument that the Blazers played the Mavericks better than anyone else did in, the, in their championship run. And then in the second round, the Mavericks, for years perennial underachievers they did not have home court advantage and they walked into LA the the LA was going for a three-peat everyone thought that if anyone was going to get in their way of that three-peat it would be either San Antonio or the newly formed uh, trio super team down in Miami with LeBron, Wade and Bosch but hold and behold Dallas as I said considered perennial underachievers for many, many years, and deservedly so, by the way. Uh, keep in mind, we weren't that far removed from when they had won, what was it, 67 games? The number one seed in the playoffs, Dirk Nowitzki was the MVP, and they were bounced in the first round by the eight-seeded Warriors. And they weren't just bounced. Usually when you see a team win uh, as an eight-seed over a number one seed, it was up until that point. It was they were close series. Think of Denver versus Seattle. That went to the decisive game five. Think of uh, the Knicks versus the Miami Heat. That once again went to a decisive game five. They were close series. This is the first time we ever really see we ever really saw. Excuse me, a team a number eight seed team truly dominate a number one seed. So they really were playoff underachievers. And a lot of people felt that the the same thing was going to happen against the Blazers, but no, they won in six games, 
And then they went up against Kobe Bryant, uh, Phil Jackson, uh, a lot of talent, Pau Gasol, Andrew Bynum, Lamar Odom, all those guys, Derek Fisher, and Ron Artest, Meta World Peace, whatever you want to call him. And these guys had won consecutive NBA championships were going for a three-peat. And they went into LA for the first two games and they essentially shocked the world and won those first two games. And then they blew them out the next two games in Dallas. It was a, it was, it was an eye-opening sweep. It really was. And then, of course, Phil Jackson, as I said, was fired. And we didn't see Phil Jackson or really hear from Phil Jackson for quite some time until they brought in Dwight Howard. They fired Mike Brown, who was brought in to replace uh, Phil Jackson. They brought in Mike Brown. Not a bad coach, by the way. People say a lot of negative things about Mike Brown, but he really validated himself when he did a better job than what Steve Kerr did for the Warriors in the 2017 playoffs. Then, after they fired Mike Brown, they had bigger staff in, not JB Bickerstaff, his father, Bernie Bickerstaff. And he went 5-0. and But it was made very clear that he was just an interim. The Lakers had too much talent and they weren't going to muck around. They wanted, they had uh, Pau Gasol, they had Meta World Peace, Ron Artest, whatever, as I said, whatever you want to call him. Just don't call him Caitlyn Jenner. The, you've got, you had Kobe, obviously. You had Derek Fisher. You had Dwight Howard. You had a loaded, uh, on paper, this team was a super team. But it was obvious that they needed a strong coach, a coach with a a proven track record of winning championships to still get them over the hump. And there was a lot of speculation that Phil Jackson was going to return. And I remember talking to Roland Lazenby, excellent author, some great, great historical NBA books uh, have come under his name. And he was saying how scary... The tr- the, how similar the trajectories of Dwight Howard and Shaquille O'Neal would be at that point. Because you think about it, Dwight Howard, drafted by the, by the Magic, takes his team, uh, he's a young prodigy, an athletic prodigy, can't shoot free throws though, takes his team to the NBA Finals, loses, uh, and then can't get back to the Finals, ends up going to the Lakers, and then Phil Jackson would end up coaching him. And of course would also be playing with Kobe Bryant. Exact same thing with with Shaq. Now, of course, there's some small semantical differences, such as, okay, Dwight Howard didn't leave one season after making the finals like Shaq did. But as I said, and also Shaq played a couple of seasons prior in LA to bring in Phil Jackson. But those are very small differences. You're never going to get truly mirroring uh, ex- uh, examples here. But I thought that was very interesting. That, but it was considered a done deal. That's just, that 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 was the eye-opening part of it. But for whatever reason, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that they brought in Steve Nash. I, I forgot to mention him before. I said Derek Fisher was on that team. Uh, Derek Fisher, as far as I can remember, was not on that team. I think they had traded him for uh, Ramon Sessions uh, in the season prior to it. But they brought in Steve Nash. So I believe they actually went in the in the direction of... Phil Jackson won because Dr. Jerry Buss, who was on his deathbed, I hate to say, but at the time he was, he did not want Phil Jackson back on the team. And the other reason, the basketball-related reasoning for it was, well, let's bring in a coach that's actually uh, used Steve Nash to his maximum before, and that was Mike D'Antoni. And Mike D'Antoni said later on that he was surprised. He was shocked. He was He thought, well, Phil Jackson's going to get this job. He was so surprised when they selected him. And then we never, we did not hear from Phil Jackson for a few years, but there was always speculation that he was going to come back to the Knicks. At some point, he was going to be the savior for the Knicks. And yes, he did. He, he, he waited. He did not bite at the first offer. He waited and waited and waited. And he got a tremendous deal with the Knicks to essentially run that organization. And the first basketball move he really did was draft Pozingas. And you heard from the reaction. Fans hated it. The media hated it even more. I was on record. I did not like it because I didn't know anything about it. And this is why I stay away from the draft. 
Anyone that tells you they know what's going to happen with, with players that are drafted, they're, they're absolute liars. Nobody knows. And yeah, they might cite examples where they're right, but I guarantee you they've been wrong at least 40% of the time, if not more higher. Because nobody knows. It's even worse than trying to figure out uh, free agent signings. Well, they're Because at least we've seen them on this level. Some, like, look, look at Kyrie Irving, for example. Who would have thought, after watching his career at Duke, that he would have trans, uh, transcended into the player that he became in the NBA? And that's just one example off the top of my head. Now, certain players, you've got a pretty good idea that they're going to be great. But look at the player that was drafted after uh, Kyrie Irving. Derek Williams. He was a beast in college. I would have sworn that he would have had a better career in the NBA than what Kyrie Irving was going to have. But yet he, he didn't. He, like, like, it just blows my mind at how uh, this is not a science. There's so many factors. I remember having Joe Smith on the show. Joe Smith played a thousand games in the NBA and uh, we were talking and I said to him point blank, and I said, you know, you were a guy that was, you know, they instantly put you at the, at the four because you're six foot 10, but you were really more of a Kevin Garnett, who, you know, an athletic guy that could step out on the perimeter, had good ball handling skills, could shoot the ball. You weren't necessarily a post-up guys, especially in those early parts of your career. So what would you, how do you think it would have happened? This is a question I posed to him. And it's in the archives if you want to check it out on I still love this game com. I said, what do you think would happen had you or were if you were drafted in, uh, by the Minnesota Timberwolves with Kevin McHale and Flip Saunders instead of Golden State? Because those guys, Kevin Garnett was six foot eleven and he, he was athletic, and they put him at the three and Gugliata was at the four. So had they had the vision or the insight to play Joe Smith at the three, who knows what he would have become? And he agreed. He said, you know, and that's my point altogether. That, like, it's, it's not even the talent. It's not even the work ethic. It's not even the, the, the maturity or how smart a player is. It, it, sometimes it just comes down to the situation and teams don't know what to do with certain talent. But Phil Jackson saw what he needed to see with Porzingis. And to hell with everyone else. He could have gone with a much safer pick. And yeah, the, you know, the Twitter would have been happy. You know, Instagram would have been happy. It would have been getting so many uh, uh, emoji uh, uh, approvals, uh, tweets sent to him in his direction. But he didn't care. And he was right. That's the funny thing. He was 100% right. All these, and, I'm, and to a lesser extent, I'm included in this, all these people that react so quickly... We don't know what we're talking about. And some play, and this is what my, my reaction was. I did not like the pick, but there are certain people in basketball you should give the benefit of the doubt to. Jerry West is one, and Phil Jackson is another. Red Auerbach, if he was still alive, would be the other one. Instant benefit of the doubt. Let's wait and see what they do on the court. Now, did he make some mistakes in New York, Phil Jackson? Of course. There's no question about that. But his hands were tied because of bad trades. They did not always have their draft pick because of trades. So what did he do? Yeah, he brought in Derrick Rose. Yeah, he brought in Joe Kim Noah. But what else was he meant to do in those circumstances? The team was, was not even mediocre. So in order to get better, you don't have a draft pick. You Sometimes you have to roll the dice on some of these players. And Derrick Rose, as we've seen in Minnesota, he wasn't bad in New York either. I fully accept that you've got to at least do something. If the team's not good, you've got to do something with it. But Porzingis was the guy that the, the Knicks were starting to build around. It became very, very obvious. Now, what happened with Phil Jackson was he, wanted to, he never wanted to re-sign Carmelo Anthony. But the owner, James Dolan, he wanted Melo because he was considered the attraction. So in order for them, for tourists or whoever, like, whether it was international or domestic people that were visiting New York, they wanted to go see a Knicks game at the Garden, Madison Square Garden. They needed to at least have some kind of talent, known talent, to justify those huge prices on those games. So they needed Carmelo. And he was said, whatever, need, whatever means necessary, you, you resign Carmelo Anthony. And that included the no-trade clause. So, 
as much as he was in charge of the operations, it was still Nolan's team. And James Dolan, his influence on this team, that's probably the biggest thing that's hold, that's held the Knicks back for so long. But I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get too too off track with this. So, begrudgingly, uh, Phil Jackson re-signed Carmelo Anthony. We all know how that worked. Look, Carmelo gets shat on so much. I'm not going to shit on him again. But I think people forget how good he actually was in a Knicks uniform. He was not this washed-up player throughout his Knicks career. He was an excellent scorer for the Knicks. I just don't think he was worthy of the max contract and a no-trade clause. That's all I'm saying in this. However, Phil Jackson started to to work him the way that he would work other players in in the past. He had weird motivational skills. A lot of millennials do not understand this. He would send out messages via the via, via the tra- uh, uh the press that maybe he'd be better off elsewhere once again he was right actually no he's wrong when you think about it the knicks would have been better off with him elsewhere when he went to oklahoma and houston he was not better off when you think about it but he was looking up for the knicks best interest phil jackson that is by saying that Melo should really explore other options but when you look at it from what phil jackson was saying he's 100 percent honest too the Knicks could not, if Melo was interested in a championship, the Knicks could not offer that to him. Which makes the decision for Melo to re-sign there all the more mind-blowing. However, we did see great signs from Porzingis in terms of his development. Dude, we all know it. Look, seven foot three, ungodly long arms, could shoot the ball. He was, like I said before, Kevin Garnett was a six foot eleven small forward and that was considered unheard of this guy was a seven foot three small forward <laughs> and he was a, it was an insane shot blocker uh, as you would expect really really good outside shot for his size he if he was six foot seven or six foot six he still would have made the nba because he was that good of a shooter and it quickly turned into his team it was no longer carmelo's team carmelo was no longer the focal point on offense the rebuilding process was around pausing this, and he was considered untouchable. There was no one really in the game that you could trade for, maybe LeBron at that stage, but there was no other individual you could trade straight up for Pazingas. However, Phil Jackson, and Knicks fans loved him. Let's, let's, <laughs> hold on a second. Before I get into that, Knicks fans fell in love with him. Finally, there was a glimmer of hope. Who would have thought? Think back to, you know, what was it, 20 minutes ago, not even that, 15 minutes ago at the start of this episode, and how badly he, Knicks fans responded to him. They booed him without mercy. And keep in mind, this guy wasn't even, what, 20 years old? And this is his first experience in the United States, as far as I know. Welcome to the United States, Porzingis. <laughs> yeah, wow. And now, when Phil Jackson dared to say, hey, maybe we should trade this guy if whilst his peak was high. Once again, he was right. Look at what they got. <laughs> Look at what they ended up getting for him. But people reacted so negatively. The media crushed him for this because they read off, you know, you know, the NBA 2K uh, stat sheet and the attributes. Oh, seven foot three, can shoot. Yeah, yeah, I get it. All right, I get it. I understand. But what Phil Jackson was doing, he's playing mind games. He saw the potential with Pazingas. My God, he drafted Pazingas, right? The first impression he made on Knicks fans as an executive was the drafting of Pazingas. So he knew, he stuck his neck out for Pazingas, Right? He put his own reputation on the line for Porzingis. But what he was doing by saying that, he knew that Porzingis loved New York. So he was leveraging that to make sure that Porzingis kept working hard. He didn't plateau off. But how did the New York media respond to that? They crushed Jackson. And with that, a lot of the fans followed the media. You talk to a lot of Knicks fans... And they'll say that Phil Jackson did not help this franchise. You know what didn't help their franchise? They didn't side with Jackson on this. Phil Jackson was right all the way along with Porzingis. They should have traded him then. 
And Porzingis was not living up to his own potential ceiling. So what happened next is Phil Jackson could not do anything right. No matter what he did was was viewed, was uh, hit with such skepticism that not only did it enable Porzingis to do whatever he wanted, that it was now his town, that it really chopped off Phil Jackson's legs. And Phil Jackson, of course, took a buyout and he was he was gone. But isn't it funny that now, and look at what they got for him. They got, what, an underachieving Dennis Smith Jr. and a couple of first-round picks. Once again, we don't even know where those picks are going to land. So forget the questions about whether the players that they draft will actually turn out to be good or not. But we don't even know if it's going to be the 10th pick or the 15th pick or the 21st pick or the 24th pick or the 30th pick. We don't know. Talk about a, a crapshoot. This is like potentially winning a lottery ticket. <laughs> That's all it is. You might actually get, you know, the $5 one. You might get the $10 one. You might get a scratchy. I mean, <laughs> and so winning one of those tickets actually, actually doesn't guarantee anything in the first place. It just means you get a ticket. It might be completely worthless. That being said, it could be something special too. But keep, you know, considering the way the Knicks have drafted, I, I wouldn't you know, be holding my breath that they actually will do anything good. So, the point that I'm making in all this is Porzingis and Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson got this 100% right, but the Knicks media and a lot of the Knicks fans, they honestly enabled Porzingis to think that he had accomplished something great by not being a complete bust. And that's why they ended up getting so little for him. You know, had they had traded him when his value was high, imagine what they would have actually gotten for him. Jackson, as I said, 100% right. I don't want to keep repeating it. This is not a propaganda show. <laughs> but I can't emphasize that enough. And they ran this guy out of town? For dare insinuating, which is just a mind game, by the way. I mean, just because they couldn't understand what he was actually getting at, that, that being Phil Jackson, that they ran with it the wrong way. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So the fallout for all this is Pazingas is still an incredible talent. I don't know if he'll ever reach those expectations or the potential that he showed early on in his career. But Dallas got a steal with this. Meanwhile, New York got royally fucked. And if you are a genuine fan of the Knicks, my God, do you deserve better? This is bullshit. This I'm not a fan of the Knicks. I'm not a fan of any team, by the way. But I'm not a fan of the Knicks. But they deserve so much better. Any NBA franchise deserves so much better. And the rationale behind this is what? Okay, you get DeAndre Jordan. They're probably going to... Do a buyout with him. It'll be interesting where he goes. Uh, Wesley Matthews, probably the same situation. So they're going to have boatloads of cap room. I get that. So you're going to say rebuild. But think about the word rebuild for a second. To rebuild means you must have built something up in the first place. They have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. When was the last time they had anything? It was when Carmelo Anthony was a genuine MVP candidate. And they won, what was it, 55, 56 games, whatever it was. Made the second round of the playoffs. Jason Kidd was on that team. Uh, Novak was discount double checking after hitting threes. Tyson Chandler was on that team. I think Rasheed Wallace was on that team too. And uh, was it Mike Woodson was the coach? I believe Mike Woodson was their head coach. It was a year after Lin Sanity, I believe. And that was the last time that they had done anything. Beyond that, you have to go back to Patrick Ewing being on the team when they won a, a, a playoff series. This team deserves so much better. The mecca of basketball? I don't think so. This is a shitter of basketball right now. There is nothing good about that Knicks franchise. The only good thing about the Knicks franchise is where they play. Madison Square Garden. The world's most famous arena. That is the only selling point for fans or players. And if they think that they're going to bring in three or four marquee players because of their name alone, I don't think so. The NBA does not work like that. Think about the the big free agent movements over the last couple of years. Think to when LeBron went to Miami. He could have gone to Chicago. He could have gone to New York. He could have gone to the Clippers. Those are all much bigger markets 
than where he actually went to. He went to Miami. And he actually went for less money too. But he went because of the players that he was going to be around. Think of Kevin Durant, obviously. When Kevin Durant went to Golden State, he could have gone to Boston. That's a bigger market. You know, he, he could have gone anywhere he wanted. And once again, he took less money. Why did he do that? For the culture. He wanted to win. Think of LaMarcus Aldridge. People forget about him. LaMarcus Aldridge was an MVP candidate before he left Portland. He could have gone anywhere. Once again, he took less money to go to San Antonio for the culture. Players, because of the way the internet works now, and quite honestly, despite what the NBA tries to say, it's not a huge market domestically here for the product. So you can go to... It it doesn't really matter where you're playing as long as... I Think about LeBron in Cleveland. When LeBron was playing in Cleveland, he was the biggest name in basketball. Do people say, no, he's not the biggest name in basketball because he was playing in Cleveland? No, I didn't say that at all. So the point that I'm making is just if, if the Nick fans or the Nick organization think, oh, hey, we're playing in New York City. So therefore, we're going to draw in free agents. How many free agents have they drawn in, by the way? Amari Stoudemire? Is that it? <laughs> I like Amari Stoudemire, but that's it. That's a worse track record than the Lakers. Everyone thinks the Lakers is going to bring in big free agents. They brought in LeBron. Who was the last guy prior to LeBron that they brought in via free agency? Last All-Star. You've got to go back to Shaq in 96. It's usually via trades. They've lost free agents, by the way. Think about Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard was a free agent. He bolted at the moment he had the opportunity. He went and played in Houston. And if the Knicks really think that that New York market will sell itself, they should be worried about what's going on in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah, it's probably, it'd probably take you an hour to get from Brooklyn to, to Manhattan at this point because of traffic. However, I think people will stomach that. <laughs> Players will stomach that based on the culture they're building there. If you're, a, if you're an NBA player, a marquee NBA player, are you confident that they can build around you? Like, what's their track record of actually building around anybody? I mean, it took them forever before they actually pulled their finger out and put some pieces around Patrick Ewing, and that was in, what, 96? So they had Ewing for 10 years before they actually started putting some genuine pieces around him. And who did they bring in? They brought in Larry Johnson and Alan Houston. Eventually, they brought in Spreewell, too, and Marcus Camby. Beyond that, they have, what, John Starks, CBA player. They lucked into that one. They had Derek Harper. Yeah, he wasn't bad. But he wasn't the type of player that they needed consistently on the offensive end, at least. Defensively, he was a stud. But they needed more offensive firepower to help out Ewing. And they never, never, they never produced it. Ewing nearly got them to a title regardless. He got them to a game seven. But what did him in was John Starks. Because John Starks, bless his heart, he was not... A consistent shooter, a consistent scorer. There'd be games where he would explode. Like in game six uh, on the road against the Pacers in 94. But there were other games where he would he would hurt you. Just like game seven of the NBA Finals. They needed more consistent offensive players. They never produced those. Pat Riley and, and Patrick Ewing, they're the guys that actually put that team together and kept them competitive and very nearly got them to the title. That that has to eat you up at night. What if they had some? What if they didn't make that bonehead decision and get rid of Xavier McDaniel, McDaniel to bring in uh, Charles Smith? Jesus Christ! If anyone knows basketball of the nineties, do you think uh, Xavier McDaniel Daniels is going to shit the bed underneath the basket up against the Bulls in uh, Game Six? Of course not. That would never have happened with uh, Xavier McDaniel. Charles Smith had, what, four opportunities down low? He was stripped by Jordan once, blocked by Grant once, and blocked by Pippen twice. Anyway, that was a little bit off topic, but the point is, if you're a, if you're a marquee free agent, can you honestly trust that the Knicks will build around you appropriately? They've got nothing going for them. Now, go ahead and watch. After I've said all that, go ahead and watch as Kevin Durant... 
Kemba Walker and Kyrie Irving all sign there, which would be great. It would really be great because the Nick, the G- true Nick fans, they're like the Cleveland Brown fans. They just keep enduring, man. <laughs> they just keep, you know, they go there, they get shat on, and they keep coming back, you know, <laughs> and they, they wear it. They wear it with pride. So good for them. But this trade is horrible. This trade is absolutely horrible. Unless if you're the Mavericks. And it's a great trade for the Mavericks, but to hell with them too because Mark Cuban is still a certifiable piece of shit despite what, you know, a lot of the media... Because he's a, he's a media darling. I don't know why. Probably because of his political stance. But to quote the great Vince McMahon, you can't shine Kaka. And I'll leave it at that. But speaking of Kaka, I have... <laughs> that's a great segue isn't it speaking of Kaka but I have been pretty outspoken in how bad the product of the NBA is last night we had two great games at least on paper we had two great games one game was a blowout but it was a, it was an eye opening blowout uh, if you're the Toronto Raptors the M- Milwaukee Bucks are here by the way let's all stop pretending that they cannot win the Eastern Conference. I don't think they have enough to beat the Warriors or whoever comes out of the West. But they have enough to beat Toronto, and Toronto has been head and shoulders the the standard of the Eastern Conference, even though Milwaukee had the best record in the league coming in. You know, if you're overlooking this team, do it at your own peril. Because when they are locked in defensively, like they were last night, they'll make any team look bad. And I, when I say any team, I really mean any team. That includes Golden State. Now, speaking of Golden State, they have looked very good since, well, not even since, but actually it was since James Harden's game winner. I was going to say since DeMarcus Cousins has returned. That's just uh, added to it. Last night, Clay Thompson was out. We know that. So let's just get that out of the way first. But what I saw from Philly was very impressive. Once again, they were locked in. And it's hard to diagnose teams in the regular season because sometimes they're not always showing up or, or whatever excuse they want to come up with. It could be because of scheduling. It could be because of fatigue. It could be because of somebody unfollowed them on Twitter. It could be a variety of reasons. But when a team is locked in, that was like a playoff type performance from Philly. This is the type of intensity you would actually see in a playoff game. And this is why I've always said, and most I'm not the first to say this, by the way, by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a very different uh, game from, playoff, uh, from regular season basketball to playoff basketball. We saw the playoff Philadelphia 76ers. And what is, like, what is going on? In Philly when it comes to shooting, by the way. Fultz is... I don't even know where Fultz is. Is he still in the country? I don't know if he's in the country still. But, you know, did they maybe send him to Europe? Did they, you know, Is he playing down in Argentina? Who knows where this guy is? But he can't shoot. And neither can Ben Simmons. It's, it's disturbing to see how bad Ben Simmons shoots in the foul, at the foul line for a player of his capabilities. But to Ben Simmons' credit, he does other things. And I would say he has surpassed Westbrook now as somebody who can just take the ball off the glass and just push. And it does not allow teams to get set up. And the great thing about pushing, if you if you actually play basketball, if the great thing about pushing is you can always pull it back out. That's the great thing. You can push it. And see what the de- if the defense can handle that kind of pressure. If they can, guess what? You pull it back out, you still got 17 seconds on the shot clock to, to run your half-court offense. If they can't, you're going to get a good look. It's, I, I love it. I don't know why more teams don't push. I, I would love to see teams like Boston push it a lot more. But they don't. They seem to just be satisfied with walking the ball up the court, go ISO, jack up a three, and that's it. But when a team can push, you, you know, you can push even off makes. There's nothing stopping you. If you can inbound the ball quick enough, you can, you can push off that. Especially if the, uh, the point guard or the ball handler is receiving the inbounds pass around the three-point line as opposed to the baseline. 
And that's why pressing is so valuable because that reduces that the point the, the ball handle will actually have to come to the ball off the inbounds. Uh, but what I saw with Philly was fantastic. DeMarcus Cousins has, at this point, helped the uh, the Golden State Warriors. A lot of people are giving me crap for that. I, I get it. You know, it's a difference of opinion. Uh, well, I, I'm, but I don't think you really understood what I was saying, so I'll repeat it now. I'll clarify it. What I was saying is DeMarcus Cousins is obviously an addition. But... When he starts playing, when he gets back to form, right now he's on a very strict minute restriction. Try saying that 10 times quickly. But once that minute restriction is lifted, he's going to want the ball a little bit more. He's very emotional as a player. We know that. This is who he is. So when he wants the ball a little bit more, he's going to want shots more. He's going to be fine when he's on the bench, but when he's on the court, I get that he's he's gonna and where does it where do those shots come from? It's not going to be Steph Curry who's playing fantastic. It's not going to be Kevin Durant as far as I know. It's going to be Clay Thompson that's going to miss out on that. Now people have brought up well, Clay Thompson didn't miss a beat when they brought in Kevin Durant, and that's true. But keep in mind that Kevin Durant was not purely an addition. They did have to let go of Barnes, and they did have to let go of Bogut, and we saw the decline of Sean Livingston too. So a lot of those shots that Durant got came from those sources Kevin Durant oh sorry Clay Thompson did not have to sacrifice his game but when they brought in Bogut oh not Bogut excuse me when they brought in Boogie Cousins where the, there's no subtraction there. it's just purely addition and what Cousins is going to do he's going to shoot the ball a lot more than what Looney or what uh, Zaza did last year that's they, these are just facts right so where are those shots going to come from? It has to come from who, who gets the bulk of the shots now if you're Golden State. Are you really going to take the ball out of Steph Curry's hands right now? Are you going to take it out of Kevin Durant's hands? I mean, Draymond Green might get less shots now, but they're leaving him wide open now anyway. So <laughs> how many more shots is he meant to turn down? It's going to come at the expense of Klay Thompson once Cousins rounds into shape and he gets a little bit more, he gets his legs underneath him. It's just, it's just that simple. You know, unless if they pick up the pace even more, and I don't know how much more that they can pick it up, and they start putting up 140, 150 points a game, maybe those extra shots will come from there. But it's not so much of a... It's more of a percentage thing. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I'm not ready. I've never been ready to just simply concede that this... Uh, Warriors team is unbeatable. I mean, we saw this last night. Clay Thompson didn't play. Yeah, I get it. But still, Philly walks right into them. And if we're going to use, you know, that they have they've won seven of what, the last eight, nine games, whatever it is. They've been on a bit of a roll too. Boston was very competitive with them. You know, these teams, it's not a situation where they're losing by 40 or 50 points to these teams. The, the teams are still competitive. As I said earlier on this season though, and this is a big turnaround from the last five or six years, the biggest competition the Warriors will, will face will probably come in the NBA Finals as opposed to the, conference, uh, the Western Conference. So that's interesting and exciting because I'm sick of being bored in the NBA Finals. I don't, I don't know about you guys. Anyway, I'm going to call it a wrap at that. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Super Bowl weekend. If you did not catch the uh, Garbage Time episode... I did predict the Patriots to win. I don't know how confident I am with that. But in even bigger news, even bigger news, my second book is nearly complete. Six Rings. I may change the name of it to Six for Six. Not sure yet. Give me some feedback, guys. But <clears throat> a little bit about the book. I'm going to interview myself here. Matt, what are, you, what are you writing a book about? Well, Matt, I'm glad you asked. Now, the book is... It's not necess- People have already assumed, because I posted a picture on social media of the cover so far and they're already assuming that I'm it's just going to be Jordan's best because he's he's won six rings well no dummy you don't think I know my NBA history if it's just about rings and it's going to be Bill Russell or Sam Jones the the purpose of the book is Jordan Jordan with the first essay that his greatest accomplishment was winning six titles 
but that's not his only, only accomplishment. So the purpose of the book is to go through, line him up against Bill Russell, line him up against LeBron, line him up against Will and Magic and Bird and Kareem and so on. And instead of just saying, well, this is Jordan's resume and this is why he's the best, that's actually doing a direct comparison. So envision yourself having a conversation with your mates and someone says that Larry Bird was better than Michael Jordan. And that's essentially what this book is. It's comparing the careers and legacies and the accomplishments of these players. So it's a direct comparison with those, with those players. So was Larry Bird better at his peak than what Michael Jordan was? And it's lining that up. So that's what the purpose of that book is. It will be out. People have been asking me this as well. It will be out hopefully before March. And I'm excited. I'm excited to see your reaction to it because this is something that unfortunately needs to be said because there has been a lot of re-engineering of Jordan's career of the last five years. You have to ask yourself why. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can put two and two together and realize why. But I'm excited to, to finally finish this. And then I can move on to my next book. will be about Wilt Chamberlain. I'm excited for that one because a lot of people don't realize how good he was. And they scoff at the notion that I have him so high on my list. Anyway, guys, thank you for spending your time with me. Uh, please be safe this weekend. If you're in Australia, my God, I miss that weather. <laughs> I miss it so bad, but it's all right. I'm still doing fine here, looking outside at a big bunch of snow, but that's okay. It's all right. I get to, I get to ride again. But uh, if you're in the United States, please stay, stay safe and stay warm and uh, continue to send through your messages, your emails. I appreciate every single one of them. Well, not every single one of them, but I appreciate every single one of them that's not calling me a racist. <laughs> Take care, guys, and enjoy your weekend.